So first of all, shout out to the two women who are sitting next to us at Sarah Beth's. We salute you. <laughs> um, when I was a reporter, I was a registered independent. Wasn't a Republican, wasn't a Democrat on the record. Never gave money to Planned Parenthood, even though I'm on the national board now. And when we gave um, money to political candidates, Jerry wrote the check. So I would have deniability. And I don't feel that bad about that because, in fact, you begin this book with an anecdote about characterizing you, Carrie, whom you covered in Albany and I covered, as the finest public servant you'd ever known, and then immediately reflexively thinking, a reporter shouldn't say that. So explain to these people why both of us were foolish or at least vainglorious about that. Well, so we both grew up with certain norms of journalism that I take some issue with uh, in this book, uh, that um, there's two sides to every story, and if you, if you want to avoid the worst insult that anybody can hurl at a mainstream journalist, which is you're biased, you're not objective, how do you prove that you're not biased and that you are objective is to just simply quote whatever somebody wants to say to you on the other side of the story and that kind of thing. Um, when I covered Albany, I actually didn't vote in New York. I kept my registration in my parents' house in, in Connecticut. And, and I did see that as a certain kind of insulation. Um, you know, when I moved to Washington, where of course vote doesn't count anyway, so I figured, well, you know, might as well register where I'm, where I'm living. But, um, uh, you know, I'm not at war with every single thing that passes for journalistic ethics, not at all. But what I try to do in the book is unpack those that I think um, are either unnecessary, uh, diminish a journalist's claim to being a basic ordinary citizen, a status that I think is very important in a democracy, or those that get in the way of serving what I take to be the highest purpose of journalism, which is to uh, help enable and inform citizenry to make informed decisions in a democracy. And so if it's just he said, she said, and the reporter knows that one of them is right and the other one is wrong, but is disabled by these norms from sharing that knowledge with the reader or the viewer, uh, you're, you're, not, you're not serving that purpose. You also talk, I think, in a really interesting way about um, one of the ways that we try to get around this, and that's the many people see as effect. Fox News, which many people see as a conservative outlet. <laughs> right, right, and the Times actually said, I actually quote that. Now, I don't, the Times wouldn't write it today, but this was maybe four or five years ago. Is to, uh, yeah, Fox News, which some see as a, right, the, the distancing techniques um, are sometimes more subtle than that, so, uh, you know, knowledge that the reporter has but somehow feels that she can't directly convey in her own voice comes in the voice of an expert. Now, how do you know that person's an expert? They have a title. What kind of title? Professor. Well, there's like a million professors. And I have some case studies in, in the book of uh, professors who are called upon or who put themselves forward to be the expert, uh, a tester to basically any old thing. As long as, they, as long as you spell their name right, and it, they, it has the patina of, uh, you know, this is great, this reporter's digging deep and relying on a real expert. No, the reporter's lazy or somehow unable due to the editor's view of the reporter's function or whatever of just saying what she knows flat out, just say it, so. so there's one particularly interesting case you have in here of someone who has, a title at an organization, and the organization sounds very official, um, and, and well, you tell it. The, the right, so, so on the two sides to every story, sometimes this comes up in the context of criminal justice or the justice system, <clears throat> and there's an outfit in Sacramento, California called the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation, yes. right? 
That sounds like a great big organization. It's a teeny tiny, I think they have two paid employees in Sacramento. I've looked at their Form 990s, the IRS form, and you the tiny little budget. And they are brilliant because they exist for one purpose, and that is to be the other side of the story. And if you Google or, or look in the, in the Times database for the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation and its uh, founding staff member who's been there for 30 or so years, a brilliant man named Kent Scheidegger, you'll see dozens and dozens and uh, probably over 100 hits because um, they always get, they, I say they, that's a mistake, he always gets called and uh, it's always there to answer the phone because that's what they, that's what they do. And because reporters look at past stories mm -hmm. on similar subjects and think, who should I call about this? Right, right. And sometimes, many times, there's no need to call anybody. I mean, for instance, um, a judicial decision comes down. And what's the other side of the story? Well, there's no other side of the story. The decision is the decision. You can do the heavy lifting of looking back at the briefs to say, oh, the losing side made this kind of argument, but the court rejected it, and the winning side made this kind of argument. You don't need to bring in some outside voice to, to be the counter to what actually occurred, but very, very often you do, and often if it's a criminal justice matter, um, it's the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation. So the, the fiction is the reporter as tabula rasa. That's what, that's what we've, have we sold that to people over the years? Have people chosen to believe that? How did we wind up there? Well, it's a safe space. It really, um, you know, it, it's in sort of modern, of course, we, it wasn't always this way. Journalism used to be overtly very opinionated and so on. Uh, but in, in, the, in the modern era, um, it's the best protection against the schoolyard bully. Uh, to be the to tabula rasa as if every day is a day made new and you have no opinions. I quote in there um, in, in the book uh, Leonard Downey, the fabled uh, top editor of the Washington Post. Um, I don't know him personally, but you know, cast a very long shadow over Washington journalism. Uh, highly acclaimed and highly accomplished. And when he actually, maybe I should just read it. When he my, my copy of this book has more dog years and underlining in it. It's kind of, it's the antithesis of saying to a little kid, don't write in books. <laughs> I've written all over this one. So when he retired, he gave a talk and he, he famously never voted and he didn't believe that journalists should vote. But he said, I didn't just stop voting. I stopped having even private opinions about politicians or issues so that I would have a completely open mind in supervising our coverage. So what I say here is, while few journalists would or could go to such an extreme, Downey's position nonetheless stands as a kind of Greek ideal. I never heard anyone question, let alone criticize it. I regarded it as troubling, even frightening, to impose on journalists a sense of isolation from the civic life around them, from the very essence of citizenship. So that's kind of where we are. Well, let's go to two very well publicized occasions when you decided that you could feel free to act as an ordinary citizen and the poobahs of the profession disagreed. First of all, uh, the uproar when you marched in uh, a march uh, for safe and legal abortion. Yeah, so, so that and, and the second one you're probably going to get to, I think, are examples of the kind of what I call the, the spasm of sanctimony that's come to envelop uh, mainstream journalism. So back in 1989, uh, there was a scheduled uh, march, kind of a forerunner of the, of the women's march, and um, I decided to go with a couple of college classmates and I told everybody in the office that I was going and invited people to come and join me. Um, I did, there were about 500,000 people there, you know, marched with my classmates. And, and um, the afternoon of the march, there was a party, a, a Times party of uh, somebody was retiring and I came to the party and I said, you guys missed a great march. Nobody raised a hair, nobody raised a hair. 
So what happened was that um, Leonard Downey, who I just quoted from, uh, learned that some of his reporters at the Washington Post had also marched. And, uh, and he was quite upset about that. Since if you don't vote, you certainly don't march. And uh, my friends at the Washington Post said, well, what's the big deal? Over the times, Linda marched very, you know, nobody had a problem with it. So the, I think the Washington Post media reporter then was tasked with calling uh, Max Frankel, who was the executive editor of the New York Times at that time, to say, like, what's the policy on this? So Max Frankel could hardly be out ethics by Leonard Downey, and he said, <laughs> this is terrible, we have rules against that, which actually they didn't, that was the issue. So um, they quickly, ex post facto, made a rule about it, and um, you know, I was the sort of cannon fodder for, for that, so that, that's, that was one example. That's when you wrote, I wasn't sorry and I didn't think I had made a mistake. Yeah, nobody at the time thought I was making a mistake. It only became a mistake after the fact, but you know, that's, that's true in politics. Let, let me just, uh, I want to go to the, the next time that, as I think of them in the Pantheon, Linda got herself in trouble. But um, uh, let me stop because you say, uh, he said it was against our rules, and the truth was we didn't have a rule. Isn't that true of most of journalism? I mean, nobody ever, people are always surprised to hear this. You don't walk through the door and get an ethics code. This is who you talk to, this is who you don't. It's, it's, it's actually, handed down kind of through osmosis. Actually, I think these days, maybe and partly because of this, um, there is a, a printed ethics code, actually. Not, not on maybe on, you know, we follow the he said, she said rule, no. But exactly. on the kind of, the kind of uh, personal behavior, I think. I think uh, but not on how we write stories. No, no. I mean, that's transmitted through, of course, no reporter owns the real estate. So uh, at least in the old days at the times before they fired all the copy editors and stuff, I mean, any story that appeared went through many layers of editing. Right. So uh, the, the rules would be enforced, if you will, you know, in, in the actual workplace, the actual work of transmitting the information into the actual newspaper. Explain to me what I think was implicit in Max Frankel's rebuke. Whether, why marching in a march supporting safe and legal abortion would not in fact impact your coverage of abortion cases that came before the Supreme Court. So, uh, the takeaway from this book, Inside the Beltway, back in Washington, it probably hasn't reached here. Um, a columnist for the Washington Post read the book, and the one factoid, this truly surprised me, that jumped out at him was the fact that I say in the book that um, I wrote a monthly check to Planned Parenthood. Now, how did that come about? I'll just read that part of it. And this, this is a, a somewhat long and winding answer to your, to your question. But Those I, of us at Planned Parenthood salute you. <laughs> and hope everyone in the audience will join in. So, here's what I say. Every year, back when I was working at the Times in New York, uh, the publisher solicited employees to authorize a payroll deduction for contributions to United Way. When I worked in New York, I always contributed after checking the list of United Way beneficiaries and seeing that Planned Parenthood was on the list. When I arrived in Washington to cover the court, I checked the list and was surprised to find that the local Planned Parenthood affiliate was missing. I called United Way in Washington to ask why. After being passed among several employees, I finally reached someone who told me that the problem was that Planned Parenthood was controversial. I replied that I didn't see much controversy in curbing the high teen pregnancy rate in the District of Columbia and that I would henceforth make my own contribution directly to Planned Parenthood. I described this encounter in a letter to Arthur O. Salzberger, the Times publisher, and posted a copy of my letter on the office bulletin board, urging colleagues to follow my example. If anyone did, they kept that knowledge to themselves. I continued to send a check to Planned Parenthood every month for the rest of my career, and still do. I turned down the option, which charities much prefer, of an automatic monthly deduction from my checking account. It was important to me to write a check every month and sign my name. It was the signature of a citizen. The stories that appeared under my byline, 
on abortion and all other subjects were the work of a journalist. If anyone ever thought those failed to measure up to professional standards, they never told me or anyone else. So if you Google my name in Planned Parenthood, I'm sure you have better things to do, so I'm not <laughs> suggesting that, but if you did do that, you would see this outraged response on the right-wing blogosphere. I mean, right-wing websites that I'd never heard of, basically, um, you know, saying I, I outed myself, I did something against the rules, and obviously from the narrative that I, I read to you, um, it was totally open and nobody objected. Now there's a kind of sense that, oh my God, we don't do that because of, again, what I call the spasm of sanctimony that has come to, come to envelop uh, uh, mainstream journalism, uh, which is very, um, very much on the defensive now because the right and the effort to delegitimize mainstream journalism uh, pushes all the, all the buttons. And, you know, like any bully in a schoolyard, um, if you don't stand up the first time, there's going to be a next time and a next time and a next time. So uh, there, when, when we first got into the business, mainstream journalism was basically what there was. Mm -hmm. Now we have advocacy journalism on the left, advocacy journalism on the right, screamers on the left on television and radio, screamers on the right on television, radio, and, and smushed in the middle, mm -hmm. we have so-called mainstream journalism. So how did we get from here to there? Did, did any of our insistence on doing this, he said, she said, lead us to this place? In other words, are mainstream norms from 20, 30, 40 years ago in any way complicit in what's happened to journalism? Well, I think, I mean, I'll, I'm, I'm going to focus on the right because I think the right has okay. been uh, much smarter and much more strategic and focused than the kind of mishmash that passes for the left uh, these days. And I think what what we see are um, advocates who understand mainstream journalism more profoundly than mainstream journalism understands itself. They know how to exploit those very norms, uh, as in the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation, which is funded by uh, you know, conservative groups in California, that's where they get their money, um, who, who understand that uh, a voice on that side is going to be sought, is deemed as necessary by the norms of mainstream journalism, and so provide it. And I mean, that's one tiny example, but I, so that I, I think, um, you know, complicit is an interesting word, but certainly, uh, you know, mainstream journalism w was a, a sitting duck for what we've seen develop over the last 20 years or so. But the current situation in which we find ourselves has changed the norms. Yes. So you and I were talking backstage about the fact that we both knew a reporter who was standing slightly behind Anwar Sadat when he was assassinated. And I remember in the newsroom there was endless discussion over and over about whether, in fact, anyone could, could or should say that. Should we keep the reporter entirely out of the story, which seemed somewhat vainglorious since in photographs you could see him. And eventually it was decided that he could refer to himself later in the story as this reporter, which is what we used to do when we got caught in something really historic. Again, it was a kind of a, a fig leaf to say, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Right. Fast forward to a moment when the New York Times decided to use the word lie to describe something said by the President of the United States. So did, did this onslaught from the right and to a lesser extent the left push us to that place? Did Donald Trump push us to that place? Should we have always been in that place, according to you, when we call something that appears to be at variance with facts, <laughs> a lie. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated story because, of course, 
Lie, as I understand it, means you know the intentional fomenting of something that the speaker knows isn't true. So, you know, something that's not true could be the result of a mistake, uh, a delusion, a misunderstanding. Uh, you know, and and you uh, don't want the delusion <laughs> option, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's so powerful. Right now. <laughs> but you know, you don't want to go around labeling, you know, every misstatement um, a, a, as a lie. But I think. Uh, Certainly, the Trump candidacy, uh, which was unfolding as I was working on this book, did put the norms to the test. Because uh, if you know not only that something isn't true, but that the speaker, there's every reason to think that the speaker knows that Barack Obama is a natural born US citizen and thereby entitled to serve as president, but yet is maintaining otherwise. Uh, you know, call it a lie, sure, call it a lie. And, and you know, had there been a, a, a political personality like Donald Trump, it should have happened sooner. Uh, one question I raise at the very end of the book is, will this outlast Trump? It's certainly an artifact of the Trump era, but will eventually there be a regression to the mean and, and journalism will kind of pull back from that, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And did it precede Trump? I mean, one of the things that I ask people to do all the time when they talk about, you know, the golden age of journalism, which everybody seems to think took place actually when we were both reporters, but anyhow, um, <laughs> it is, did, it did. is to go back and look at microfilm and microfiche. If you go back to the New York Times in the 1950s, for example, it is an exceedingly boring paper that covers New York City as though there are no poor people and no people of color in it. If you go back to a lot of New York newspapers in the 20s and 30s, it's not even yellow journalism, it's orange journalism. So this idea of this perfect, this perfect snow globe of objectivity, it shows that we're not always as historically on the money as we need to be. Right, and of course in other countries, in, in, <coughs> in Europe, uh, there's a very robust <laughs> journalism of <coughs> newspapers and media outlets that are openly, proudly identified by their politics. And, you know, they're, they're, people can pick from a menu and, and that's fine as far as I know. All right, so we talk about how, in fact, Journal, uh, reporters are not, uh, <coughs> my editors at the New York Post used to say, journalist, schmernalist, you're a reporter. So reporters are not tabula rasas, everything I believe, everything I am, everything comes to the table with me when I write a story. Uh, Bob Schieffer just said that we are in an era of buyer beware journalism. So how is the reader, how are these people to decide what to give credence to and what not to? Well, that's a fair question. And, and uh, you know, I think it takes, it takes long-term engagement with the media outlet to get a sense of uh, whether what they're doing is grounded and, and, and reliable. Um, you know, I don't, think, I don't think dipping in for one edition or one, you know, news hour or whatever can, uh, can answer that question. What about more than one outlet? Do you think anybody can rely on one media outlet anymore? Uh, personally, I think the Times is very reliable. I mean, I... <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, You're kind of tough on the New York Times in this book. Well, it's a tough love, <laughs> I think. No, seriously. I mean, um, you know, I think what comes through in the book is a certain frustration that um, at, at times when I would have liked to see the Times um, shed some of these norms that I consider disabling. Um, and I think that's, they're, they're so built into the DNA that I think that's hard, but I think I think it's actually happening, at least at the margins, not because of me, but just because of the climate that we're, that we're living in, where um, you know, it's, it's finally become clear that, for instance, I mean, one example that I use is 
is the voter ID situation where, um, you know, the, in, in red states, uh, putting in these very strict voter ID requirements, uh, which we know are there uh, to disable certain people from exercising the franchise, but the politicians who support this say, well, this is necessary uh, to deter fraud at the polls, and people who smell a rat will say, no, actually, it's a very cynical way of trying to keep uh, Democrats from voting. Many, many stories simply quoted those two sides. One says, the moon is made of green cheese, the other one says it's not. Reader, viewer, you decide. And, but over time, if you look at the voter ID stories, you'll, you'll see more and more of a voice coming into those stories to say, actually, dear reader, uh, there is no voter fraud of the in-person, hello, I'm Melania Trump and I'm here to cast a vote. No, that actually doesn't happen. And so these very strict voter ID laws are not, in fact, necessary. And you can read stories and they'll actually tell you that. The way the Times tends to do things like that is to say, articulating the widely discredited view that, you know. <laughs> Well, are, are things like, you know, climate change. I right, mean, climate uh, change is probably job one. Is, is one. Um, or, you know, another example that you still see, but less, um, speaking of abortion. So the, um, what are called the TRAP laws, uh, T-R-A-P, tar Targeted Regulation of Abortion Providers, the Texas type law that puts uh, regulations on abortion clinics that are unnecessary and that the clinics can't meet and that the, will cause the clinics to close. So the politicians who put these in say, well, this is necessary for women's health. And the Planned Parenthood spokespeople would say, actually, no, it's not. And the stories for years would say, some say it's for women's health, some say it's not for women's health. We've gotten more sophisticated and now thanks in part because of the Supreme Court in the summer of 2016 invalidated that law. Remind me, was it Sotomayor or Kagan, uh, the attorney f for the state of Texas, of course, was arguing that this was to protect women's health. And when one of the absolutely female justices, if you ever wanted to know whether female representation matters, you only need listen to the court arguments on certain issues, said, but what about these women who in West Texas are six hours away from his clinic, and, and he replied that, that they were only two hours away from New Mexico. And I believe it yeah. was Sotomayor who said, so we have an interest in protecting their health, except when they go to New Mexico. Which didn't have these regulations. Which didn't have these regulations. Yeah, yeah. It was right. a whoosh yeah. moment. Right, right. Um, so you still think the Times is the gold standard? I do, actually I do. How about the po Washington Post? I think the Post is great. Um, I don't read it every- Resurgence. Resurgence? Resurgence. Thanks to you know, Jeff Bezos and his money. Um, they've hired lots of great people and um, are doing a fabulous job. I, you know, I, don't, I don't read the Post cover to cover or you know, website one, but I, I look at it every day and, um, and I get a daily feed of their op-eds and so on and um, I think it's great. So it seems to me that one of the issues that we have to confront is that the papers that used to be the backbone of smaller communities seem to be disappearing or at least losing a lot of their muscle. Well, that's definitely true. Um, I mean, when I started covering the court, for instance, uh, there were reporters there from the Washington bureaus of the chains of local, you know, Scripps Howard or McClatchy or, you know, basically family-owned chains of fine regional newspapers. And gradually all those got sold and closed and, uh, you know, I never saw the people anymore and I, I think there's been a kind of a hollowing out of um, the smaller kinds of journalism. Now, that's not entirely true. I mean, we have a we have a place up in the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, and the Berkshire Eagle was mm. um, a great regional newspaper, the incubator of a lot of journalistic talent of many people that you and I know. Um, but over time, the family that owned it kind of fell away and it ended up in the hands of a hedge fund. 
that just denuded it and turned it basically into a, a police blotter. Uh, but it went at the bottom of the bottom uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, three local guys, two businessmen and one retired state court judge, uh, bought it and um, put money into it, hired people, and uh, it's going great. So, you know, it, it, it takes, there's a risk, but there's a great reward in terms of um, serving a community. In terms of, sir, I mean, that's why the Salzberger family has been so devoted to the New York Times, because, yeah. not because it's a way to get rich, but because it's a way to feel you, intensely useful. Yeah. I mean, if, if I had a whole, whole, whole lot of money, if I had Jeff Bezos' money, a newspaper would be the first thing I'd buy. The well, very first thing. I mean, he bought the Post so cheaply, it was, I think, you know, a rounding error in his checkbook. I forget the, what the price was, but it was shockingly low. But now he's throwing, I throwing mean, money into it. reporters. Yeah, like. yeah, no, it's a, great, it's a great story. It's been one of the most exciting developments in journalism yeah, in the totally. last couple of years mm -hmm. because finally the, the, Times, the Times needs competition, and it so often doesn't have any, and it really has been going head to head back and mm -hmm. forth. No, it's exciting. Yeah. Um, how valuable was that year at Yale Law School that you took that led to covering the court? I, I, I'm asking because I think a lot of reporters wind up feeling at one time or another unprepared. I mean, over the years I wished I had studied econ and, and Spanish and political science in college um, more than I did. Yeah, so people probably don't know. So, so yeah, law school at the time had uh, Ford Foundation money uh, aimed at what, the Ford, what Fred Friendly at the Ford Foundation perceived as a problem of the newsrooms of America not having any legal, any intelligence about the law, or not enough. Uh, so the idea was that uh, five journalists a year would get to go to Yale Law School for a year and be first year law students. It wasn't a special curriculum, it was basic core you're a first year law student, uh, you know, make of it what you will. So I had the chance, uh, the time sponsored me in the second year that program was up and running uh, with the idea that I would then be more or less qualified to, um, to cover the court. And it certainly was extremely helpful, although the learning curve was steep and, and from my present, uh, you know, position surrounded by world-class legal scholars, of which I am not one, I, I realized how, you know, what, what the gaps were and how little I knew about certain things, but just kind of ironically, uh, the constitutional law course that I took during that year, I actually found pretty frustrating because the professor, it was all about structure, it was all about federalism and congressional power, it was very little about individual rights or, you know, the Bill of Rights or we didn't quite get to that. But it came down to start covering the court, and it was the Rehnquist Federalism Revolution, and you know, kind of new ways of looking at the allocation of powers between Washington and the states. And I got it. I mean, that was what I had learned, and I know. But for that, I wouldn't have been as fully appreciative of the, you know, the revolution in a kind of obscure, you know, whoever heard of the Tenth Amendment, the Eleventh Amendment. But that's where the rubber was meeting the road in those years, and so it was very helpful. What was the hardest thing about covering the court? Uh, the, well, the deadlines, for one. I mean, <clears throat> so at any given time, the court is, I mean, when they're not on recess, taking in new cases, that can make news. Hearing arguments, that can make news. Issuing decisions, that can make news. Sometimes all three of those on the same day. So. I thought I had a hard job, uh, you know, getting my stories in by six o'clock at night, typically. Of course, today, I, I left the, the beat in 2008, so today, the court does what it does typically at 10 o'clock in the morning, and by 10.30, people have to have something up on the website. Yeah. And that is really a challenge. I, I, don't know. I'm, I might have this wrong, but didn't you go to someone at some point and suggest that at the time that they're handing out the big decisions that they stagger them more? Oh, so, 
Yeah, so I was once at a little reception with Chief Justice Rehnquist. And, <laughs> I knew it was uh, Rehnquist, right. but I didn't want to take the chance. No, and I had a very high regard for Rehnquist. He was very good at his job. Um, and it was in, you know, coming into the June period where you get you know, gobs of opinions coming down on a Monday, a Thursday, nothing on Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. I remember <clears> you <throat> writing three and four stories, stories a, day. a day. Yeah, so I went to the Chief Justice and I said, you know, I wish there were a way that you could stagger them more. And he looked at me and he said, well, why don't you stagger them? You, 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 just because we issue them all in one day, <clears throat> you don't have to write them all in one day. So, you know, first I thought that was like a pretty snotty dismissive thing. But, you know, the more I thought about it, I mean, from his point of view, his point of view was, we don't exist to serve the press. We're the top of the heap of the American judicial system, and our audience are the lower court judges who we are informing and binding by our decisions, and that's our job, and we're not writing press releases. Now, you could quarrel with that because, of course, you know, where does the legitimacy of the court come from? It comes from public understanding, really, and from public um, regard, or at least public acquiescence. And, and so his answer to me, very flippant, uh, you know, reflected, I think, uh, you might say, inadequate understanding of, of that. But, but that's the incident that you're thinking of. How much contact do you actually have with the justices when you're covering the court? Oh, there's a fair amount of contact, but it's not, it's not profound contact. It's not... In other words, you don't read the dissent and call Justice Ginsburg and say, boy, you really were upset. Um, <laughs> no, and there's certainly not sources. I mean, um, I, no one leaks? No, I mean, in my 30 years there, I certainly never got a leak, and nobody else did either, as far as I know. Um, you know, which makes for, it's a very collegial press corps, or a, you know, it was before everybody had to run off and write for the website within the first 10 minutes, but because you're, you're not competing for information, you get all the information at the same time as everybody else. So, um, you know, you're just trying to do the best you can with what, with what you have, but it's not, uh, it, it was a very collegial, it was a, a, a pleasure to work with my colleagues from other, from other papers, but when I first got there, having covered Albany for four years, where of course you do have leaks and you do have sources, and that's how the place runs, other than a few, you know, bribes and graphs and stuff, but um, <laughs> it was better in those days. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and to get to the court where you really had no, no substantive contact with your newsmakers, I found very disorienting at first. Let, let me just veer off journalism for a minute to the court per se. Um, sometimes over the last year, it has felt to me as though the judiciary has been all that has stood between us and disaster on a number of fronts. Do you think in, in the next three years, say, that the court is going to be more important than it's been in recent decades? Well, <clears throat> we're at a very worrying, worrisome, you know, tipping point with the courts, and, and I, I'm guessing this audience um, read the recent story by Charlie Savage that was the leader, the off-lead of the paper of the Times the other day about um, the breakneck speed with which uh, the Trump administration is filling judicial vacancies. And of course, they had one vacancy so far on the Supreme Court. Will they get more? I have no idea. People who say they know actually don't know, so you can discount that fake news, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we do have to rely on the courts, but how reliable they're going to be in the future, I don't know. We're all in the same boat. And one more issue that's slightly to the left or to the right, depending on how you're looking at it, to the events in this book. Um, I wondered when I was reading about the, the uproar around you marching in that abortion rights march, which I remember so well, how much of that was abortion? For example, if it had been the Million Men's March and one of your colleagues had gone, would there have been the same response? And how much of this is gender-based? I really want to talk about being a, a woman in our business. Oh, I think it was 95% gender-based, actually. Yeah. Um, 
I do. So, yeah. And did you did you feel that in the newsroom the whole time you were working? We talked before about how you started out on the Harvard Crimson, which was a good way to know how to operate in a boys' club. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, not not so much. I mean, I came at a lucky time, as you did, when um, you know the newsrooms of America were realizing, for one thing, they had a legal vulnerability under Title VII if they uh, kept refusing to hire, promote, or, or give equal pay to their female employees. It took a while for those lessons to sink in, um, you know, but they did, and, and you know, I, I certainly think I owe my career, the trajectory of it, to the women's movement. Uh, the Times had never sent a woman to Albany, to the Albany Bureau, uh, but the Times had been sued um, in a class action uh, sex discrimination lawsuit. And when I was asked what I wanted to do next as a very young reporter, and I said, I'd like to go to Albany, and they sent me to Albany. And I don't think that would have, well, it did not happen before. I mean, there had not been a woman at Albany. Right. So, um, you know, I think we were both beneficiaries of it, and we made what we made of our opportunities. And that's, that's my whole feeling about affirmative action. I mean, people get a chance. Sonia Sotomayor got a chance uh, in an era of affirmative action to go to Princeton and Yale Law School, and she will proudly say, and look what I made of it. Clarence Thomas, through affirmative action, got the ability to go to Yale Law School and has felt ever since that he's under some kind of cloud, that you know he's kind of yeah. um, you know labeled as an affirmative action beneficiary, and that this is shameful. Here are two people with the same uh, kind of opportunity and different personality structures that have processed it in totally different ways, and so you know I just kind of throw that out there that I think you know you and I both share you know an appreciation of the historic moment at which we Absolutely. arrived. I mean, a, a woman had never covered the Supreme Court for the time, Satch. Oh, yes. No, my immediate predecessor, um, who people here may know, Leslie Olsner. Oh, that's right, yeah. of course. Who um, is a lawyer, and she left the beat to become a federal prosecutor. Right. Uh, so I don't know why I jumped right from Tony to you. No, no, no. There were several in between. And in fact, there were a number of women covering the court when I showed up there. Uh, no, that was not, by that time, that was not a gender beat. I mean, maybe in part because it was not, it is not one of the most popular beats in Washington. I mean, people that sort of live in a world that's very cognizant of, you know, law and the courts are surprised when I say that. But, you know, for the reasons that we said before, I mean, it's not the kind of fun of um, getting to know, you know, your newsmakers, the politicians, the sources. and so. You know, people who thrive on that kind of Washington journalism, the last thing they want to do is have to sit in the court press room and read briefs and opinions and, you know, cert petitions and stuff. So um, there were, it was about half women when I was there. You, you, you mentioned the word fun, and one of the things I love about this, I, I, was on a pa I was moderating a panel last week for the American Association of Medical Colleges of Doctors, and we ended with a, a surgeon who, was talking about how everything that's telegraphed to medical students is about how, you know, the billing and the healthcare dilemma, and, the, and she said, we have to communicate to them the joy of medicine. And I, I, reading this book communicated to me once again something that sometimes when we talk about journalism we lose, which is the joy of newspapering. I mean, it, you had a lot of fun, didn't you? I did have a lot of fun, yeah. Talk about first coming to the newsroom and what it was like, because you're very vivid about that. Oh, so my first, <clears throat> my first job at the Times was um, a name I think some of you recognize, James Reston. So uh, he had his own kind of internship program. He modeled it after a Supreme Court clerkship, and he would hire a kid right off a of college newspaper, right out of college for a year. And so, um, and so I did that. Uh, and then got a chance to do a, a tryout for the staff. And actually a story that I did not <coughs> put in the book, but I, I'll tell it. <coughs> so 
uh, you know, there was no guarantee that you would get a staff job. So I've been doing a fair amount of uh, writing for the paper uh, when I was working for Scotty Rest, and of course, interns never got bylines, and right. so it wasn't noticeable to the outside world. It was a but big thing to get a byline. Big thing to get a byline. Uh, but one of the editors who would publish my stuff was Charlotte Curtis, who was the, I guess in, in those days, known as the society editor. For, for the, the title evolved <coughs> as that kind of coverage evolved. She was very wonderful. And, um, you know, I think took a slight interest in me. And so I asked her whether, um, when my year with uh, Mr. Resson was up, whether I could come and work for her. And she said, um, yeah, we need somebody to write the brides and engagement stories. So you can do that. I said, great. I mean, what did I know or what, you know, I just was trying to like stick around. So I was going to write brides and engagements and like that was fine. What happened was there was a reporter on Metro. Uh, I think he might have had a bit of a drinking problem. I don't know, but he was covering a trial. Well, now you've totally muddied the water because there's so many <laughs> candidates. Yeah, okay. <laughs> He was covering a trial and he acted very badly and he made a racist comment with respect to the African American woman who was the foreperson of the jury. And this was a bit of a scandal. And he was punished by being taken off Metro and being sent to write brides and engagements. <laughs> Or Charlotte Curtis. Let's if take that it. hadn't been available, he would have gotten an obit. <laughs> I love writing obits. So I put down obits. But um, that's taking my job. So anyway, I went back in the hopper and ended up with a tryout on Metro and, um, and eventually got a byline and got sent to Westchester County to cover the suburbs, given a car and a road map, and said, you go. So that was... Uh, I did that for almost four years. Well, I just have to tell my little Charlotte Curtis story because you're going to love it, and it's a doozy. So Charlotte Curtis was not at all what one thinks of as a female newspaper reporter. She was prone to Chanel-like suits and high heels and hose always. She was very tiny. Very tiny. Her hair meticulously done. The men who had the offices on the back wall all liked her because she was what they thought a woman ought to be. And she went down and covered the demonstrations against the Miss America pageant, which has been lost to the mist of time. It's bra burning. There were no bras burnt. But a lot of young fem second wave feminists were arrested and taken to jail in Atlantic City. And they were summarily bailed out. And they could never quite figure out who had bailed them out. And after Charlotte died, Robin Morgan, who was one of them, said, now the truth can be told. Charlotte Curtis bailed us all out of jail. So I you see, she was both a journalist, the story was rather dismissive of the demonstrations, and a citizen who looked at these women in that way that you looked at Sandra Day O'Connor when she first took the bench and thought, oh, one of us, and thought, one of us. That's Isn't a great that an story. amazing story? That is. I love that story. Oh, I wish I had known that because I wrote the entry on Charlotte Curtis she, she was dead by then, for um, an encyclopedia called uh, Notable American Women. And uh, there actually was a, a book written about her, and I had a lot of material, but I, I didn't know that she story. She never wanted the truth to be told, and she was a very, she seemed like a go-along to get-along person. And then when I became deputy metro editor, and the perception was, as deputy metro editor, sadly, I was the highest ranking woman in the newsroom, and the perception was that I would become Metropolitan Editor. And she asked me to lunch at Sardi's, and she said to me over lunch, she had her fork, and she said, just remember, you will only have as much power as they're willing to give you. And I thought, I have misjudged you all these years. That was before I knew about the bail money, long before I knew yeah, about, yeah. about the bail money. So. Um, Talk a little bit about the coverage of uh, the election um, leading up to 
Election Day a year ago, 2016, because the conventional wisdom is that uh, the race was poorly covered and that that may have contributed to the end result. So my personal view, this is not in the book, you're just asking my personal view, I think, um, I think the coverage of Hillary Clinton's emails was um, way out of whack, right. much too much. And in fact, actually I quote in here, I'm not sure I can find it. Um, I'm not gonna be able to find it. Um, a really devastating little piece that ran about this. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to find it. That, you know, it, it, the kind of you know balance resided in covering the emails while like the fires were burning in the rest of the uh, rest of the plantation. So, um, or as people keep saying on Twitter today, uh, every day, no matter what happens, oh Russian collusion. But don't forget, she was using a private, private email. Server, so. Yeah. So, you know, I thought the things were just out of whack. Do you think some of that, do you think that reporters tend to be harder on liberal candidates because they don't want to be seen as being in the tank because of the widespread perception that reporters are more liberal than the rest of the population? I honestly don't know the answer to that um, because I haven't been, you know, part of any frontline political coverage. Um, I think it's more that I think reporters are easily manipulated in the way I said earlier that, you know, people understand us more than we understand ourselves. So I think in that instance, these were a lot of um, leaks from the Benghazi committee uh, staff that were, um, it reminded me kind of, of of the Whitewater investigation, which was totally nothing, you know, much to do about nothing from start to finish, but it was a highly competitive journalistic race because leaks were coming out from the independent counsel's office and being fed to one or another. And um, I, I, I think it's, it's, I think it's that. I mean. People because know how to get the competitive juices flowing. Because of deadline pressure? I mean, if we didn't have to churn it so much, would we be better at stepping back and saying, whoa there? Well, I think so. And you have to be willing to lose, to lose a story. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, not to sort of aggrandize myself in this, but, but during the height of Whitewater, when I was in the Washington Bureau, and I hated that story because it was just a bunch of garbage. Uh, I was, for some strange reason, asked to, to run the Washington Bureau for a weekend. So I said, um, I'll do it on one condition. What's your condition? My condition is that uh, if anything happens with Whitewater, um, I'm not going to write, I'm not going to sign it, I'm not going to write about it. We're going to have a Whitewater free weekend. I don't care what happens. That's the deal. Okay, they were desperate, so that was the deal. <laughs> so and, they let uh, you do that? Uh, yeah. And some story came in, like Newsweek had something or something, something, and I just sat on it. And it blew over and no one even noticed it. It was, you know, some leak that was supposed to be, you know, always timed on the weekend because Sunday no news, no real news is happening. And so, you know, people try to plant little stories because the Monday paper has to come out eventually, so it might as well have something in it. And, you know, I, I, I knew that game and I just sat on it. And, you know, I mean, because I didn't, like, care what they were gonna say about it, what could they say? Um, and more people, if, if more people had that attitude, I think we might be better if off. If you'd been running the campaign coverage. Yeah, well, it would have been different. It would have been different. Yeah. Let me, let me take a few questions from our very attentive audience here. Um, which journalists writing today do you both admire? Who do you, who do you like today? Who do you think is doing a great job today? Oh, I think there's, I mean, I could name bylines in the Times and the Post. Um, I'll name somebody else that people may not be so familiar with, um, a woman who writes for Slate, so she's only online, Dahlia Lithwick, is both uh, extremely smart and extremely funny uh, on stuff that interests me about the court and the judiciary. 
I tried she's, never to miss really, never miss really anything really Dolly writes. Yeah, yeah. And winds up on TV uh, some of the time. See, I, I watch so little TV that I oh. never caught her. But, no, um, she's ve she's she's very good. Yeah, she is. She's very good on TV. Columnist. Oh, um, well, look, I, I don't want I don't want to play favorites. No, I mean. Um, well, I'm going to play two favorites with young people because I get very excited about younger people moving up through the business. Um, I remember saying to somebody this spring, if David Fahrenholt doesn't win the Pulitzer Prize, I'm giving mine back. <laughs> and luckily, Fahrenholt won. I mean, talk about somebody who just used dogged reporting to yeah. show the emptiness and the venality of the tr so-called Trump Foundation, the lack of philanthropy among, it, it just really mm -hmm. every day pushing the mm -hmm. pencil uphill. Well, and you need editors who support that kind of work too. Uh, and, and, and also publishers who yeah. support. Good journalism is very expensive. Yeah. Very expensive. And as, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, no reporter owns the real estate in which the stories appear. So it's gotta be supported up to the very top if you're in an enterprise like that. And one of my other faves, and I don't feel like I'm playing favorites because I think a lot of you will agree, um, is um, the infant that my husband and I babysat for to make money to, um, to support ourselves while we were at Barnard in Columbia, a baby named Maggie Haberman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> who was a really difficult baby, um, <laughs> but I think has become one of the greatest uh, yeah. political reporters. Totally, I agree. Ever, ever. Um, there are so many people now who believe that all journalism is advocacy journalism, that mainstream reporters are not to be trusted. Doesn't making your beliefs public feed into that? Um, I suppose, but... Uh... You know, I was always willing to be judged by my work, and um, nobody ever found fault with my work. And you know, uh, I think if we pretend, as as Anna said earlier, that uh, we have no ideas, we have no thoughts, uh, we're disabled from participating as citizens in the life of democracy, um, journalism will lose. We'll lose people that. Um, you know, that do have thoughts. So I'm, it's the price I'm willing to pay. Well, and also, if people are really drilling down and thinking deeply, they know that that's a fiction. I mean, I remember people who would say that, that I soft-pedaled my coverage of the Catholic Church when I was a reporter because I was Catholic. And then people who said I only went after the Catholic Church as an opinion columnist because I was Catholic. And, and on the one hand, they thought I was an observant Catholic, and on the other hand, they thought, of course, that I was a, a so-called fallen away Catholic, but they certainly knew I was Catholic. Um, so readers know that we are female. Yeah. So, uh, that we may be liberal. Yeah. Do you think that's, a, uh, that's true, that common perception that reporters are more liberal than the general population? Do I think it's true? Um, I guess, but you know, it doesn't concern me actually. So. That, that we're liberal. Yeah. In fact, do you think, uh, I do think that there's a possibility that we bend over backwards in our copy to show that we're, n that we're not. I don't know. I mean, maybe I've led a sheltered life. I, I just, I never felt that. I mean, you know, when I, when I said I admired Chief Justice Rehnquist, I, I really did. You know, I mean, taking his uh, view of his job, looking at it from his point of view, he did a really good job of it. I don't think I'm, you know, I, I agreed with relatively few of his actual opinions, but I don't think, I don't think I was bending over backwards to try to you know, sort of cut him any slack. I was just dealing with reality as I, as I understood it. Um, were there other women in your law school class and did they meet resistance from law professors and male co classmates? No, not, not at the time, not by the time I was there. Um, 
I, I think, you know, I know a number of women, say a generation ahead of us, who were one of three, four, five women in their law school class, even at, you know, the more sort of open Yale Law School. And um, actually I had breakfast with such a person a few weeks ago, a wonderful woman named Carolyn Deneen King. She's a judge on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and she's a Yale Law School graduate of around class of like 58, something like that, 57. And she was one of five, and she did really well. And uh, her husband, who was also a law student, they got married in law school. They were moving to uh, Houston. He had a job with a fancy firm, and she applied for a job from um, Leon Jaworski of the Fulbright and Jaworski firm. And Leon Jaworski uh, you know, looked at her transcript and heard her out and said, uh, okay, we'll give you a job. We'll give you half pay and you can do uh, collection work. And she said that she looked at him and said, um, I reject your offer, I'm not gonna do that. And she said there was a long silence and he cleared his throat and said, all right, we'll give you full pay and you can do whatever you damn please. <laughs> <laughs> and she, uh, she's a great woman. <laughs> and she did securities work. And she became like a major rainmaking, you know, lawyer in the Houston bar, um, you know, doing securities work. Boy, I'm gonna use that story over and over again because part of what holds we women back is that we feel like we have to take what's on offer. That, that, I mean, at a certain level, you feel like you're so grateful. And frankly, they feel like you should be mm -hmm. so grateful. I mean, yeah. I, when, when I first interviewed at the Times, I was a 24-year-old a tabloid reporter, um, and very proud to be one at, at a left-leaning, very well-written paper called the New York Post. Um, owned by a woman named Dorothy Schiff, with some terrific people working there, who later worked at the New York Times, but I was interviewed by the city editor, at the Metropolitan Editor at the Times, and he offered me a job in the Westchester Bureau, and I told him that I'd already covered the suburbs when I was at the New Brunswick, New Jersey Home News, and that I only wanted to cover New York City, and I really didn't want to work in the Westchester Bureau, yeah. and he said it was nice meeting me, and I went on my way, and apparently he inveighed against the nerve of me for about six months until they realized that they had to further meet the quotas for hiring women as a function of that class action. Suit. In the meantime, I was in Westchester for four years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yes, but you hadn't worked at the New Brunswick, New Jersey <laughs> yeah, Home News. Right. <laughs> Can you talk about your course at Yale, about what you teach and, and how it fits into the law school curriculum? Oh, I teach a number of things. Um, what I'm teaching currently, so I'm I'm the kind of faculty director of our Supreme Court clinic, where, which is one of many law school clinics that do this that, and the other thing. In our clinic, the students work on actual Supreme Court cases. We have clients, uh, or we file a friend of the court briefs, or whatever. We always, we, we have an interesting docket. Um, and then every spring, I've been teaching a course I made up that I call the Institutional Supreme Court, which is kind of political science-y, about the court, on a little bit of the judicial behavior literature. And the reason I thought to do this was, um, it came as kind of a surprise to me, a gradual realization that uh, law schools don't teach about the Supreme Court. That sounds weird. Law schools teach doctrine that emanates from the court, but they don't teach about the court as an institution. That's done by political scientists. And uh, the, the people who kind of study the court um, are in the law and courts section of the American Political Science Association. So I'm trying to bridge those two things and call on both the kind of legal scholarship and the political science scholarship um, to give students, I hope, um, a kind of robust understanding of the court, its function, its role, and that kind of thing. What about teaching journalism? Uh, as far as I know, journalism isn't taught at Yale. I never took a journalism course myself, so I'm ill-equipped to teach it, I think. Um, so Emily Bazelon, um, who has 
an appointment at the law school has given seminars on writing op-ed pieces from time to time, which are quite popular because all of our students think they really have something to say and they'd like to say it on the op-ed page. Um, but no, I, I, I don't teach any journalism. Well, suppose Columbia comes to you and says, will you teach for one semester at the journalism school? What would you want to communicate to them? Well, that's interesting. Um, you know, I suppose, I suppose drawing on my own experience, um, some of the themes that I talk about in the book, uh, uh, sort of how, uh, maybe a deeper inquiry about how, how journalists should be in the world, sort of what's the role of a journalist, and obviously, you know, as some of these questions and some of your questions indicate, um, is evolving necessarily in the age that we're living in. I don't mean only politics, but, but the technology that we're living in. Um, and what does that do? What should that do in redefining the role? I mean, I don't know, but I think that would be an interesting. Because neither of us worked in the digital age. I mean, you made, you made reference. Well, of course, now I do. Because, well, yeah. Um, but and not that, as a reporter. No, but it's kind of interesting because I, you know, I write an op-ed column that appears on the Times website every other Thursday. And one thing I do in that column as a kind of a self-discipline is when I make a factual assertion or refer to a document, I create a link so that readers who are really interested or skeptical or whatever can just click on the link and see for themselves. And uh, you know, if, if that was legal scholarship, it would be a footnote, obviously. <clears throat> it's kind of a living footnote. And, um, and I like doing that because I like to have the power, I mean, the technology at hand to be able to say to readers, you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take my distillation of this argument. Read it yourself. Feel free. Read it yourself. Come to your own conclusion. Because, um, you know, I always thought when I was doing, quote, straight reporting, that my job was not to tell people what to think, but to empower them to come to their own conclusion, that would be an informed conclusion. Now, of course, writing an opinion column, you have to have an opinion or the column fails. So, but it, it can't just be an opinion, you know, I think this. It's gotta be a reported opinion, it's gotta be grounded. Um, I do a lot of- Well, a good opinion column. There are lots of opinion columns that get written out of some mental gymnastics. Mm -hmm. It's the very good ones that are obviously undergirt by good reporting. I do a lot of reporting. It's not, I don't talk to a lot of people, I do a lot of reading. And, um, you know, I think that what's, that's what makes it worthwhile, but also it's enabled by technology because I'm not at the Supreme Court anymore. And I'm writing about the court, but I can read the transcripts. I can read all the briefs. <clears throat> I, I can do everything except physically sit in the courtroom. Uh, and that would not have been possible not that many years ago. <coughs> Anything you want to add before you start coughing again? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no. Anything you want to add? No, I think we, we've covered it. Well, I want to add one thing, which is really important. <coughs> this sort of looks like a smallish book. Everything you need to know about how to look at what we do at some level is in here because we both learned to write tight. Um, a lot of the books I read nowadays, the biggest shortcoming I find in them is that they should be 50, 60, 70 pages shorter than they are. This is a tight, oh so well thought out explication of where we've been in journalism, where we might be going, why it's a hell of a lot of fun, and why it matters um, so very much from somebody who knows better than almost anyone I can think of. So thanks for sitting with me.